We welcome you to worshiping with us today. We want to start with some announcements by Stuart. Morning, everybody, and welcome. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, normally we would have turned in your fish by now, uh, but obviously everybody knows what's going on with that. So we do ask that you bring the fish by the office, the church office, and give them to Sandy. We're going to uh, turn in all the money at the end of the month. So if you need somebody to come by and pick it up for you, call Sandy, give us, and uh, we'll make arrangements. Somebody come by your house, pick it up. And uh, we have been, uh, as you see in the news, more things are opening up. We have not been authorized to open up yet by the Presbytery. We are looking into what it's going to take for us to open up. We, have dis we are thinking about uh, masks for everybody, everything that we need for sanitizing, for social distancing. So it will not be this month. Hopefully it will be next month. We'll keep everybody up to date on that. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Jeremiah 29, 13 to 14 shares with us this great promise. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Commenting on that verse, Dr. Henry Cloud states, no matter where you are in your faith journey, whether you are just testing the waters to see if there's anything out there worth believing in, or if you are a long time believer desiring a richer, more fulfilling relationship with the creator of the universe, the starting point is always the same. Seek. This is where it all begins. Seek and you will find. Thank you for joining with us this morning in Seeking God. As Mary Lou provides a musical prelude, turn the attention of your soul towards Seeking God.
Morning, everyone, wherever you are, from here, there, and everywhere. Declaration of praise this morning. Throughout the pages of Scripture, God declares his good plans for us. Jesus stated, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He also said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The Psalms proclaim, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Please follow with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Linda, you have been through something that no parent ever hopes to experience. Uh, You had a child die. Uh, Tell us a bit about what happened with that. Well, um, my son was 40 years old when he passed away, uh, which is much too young, uh, leaving behind two daughters and a uh, wife. And um, by the time he had gone to the doctor, Um, He was not one to go to the doctor, and he was in horrific pain. He had um, a torn uh, rotator cuff. He built water towers, and he did a lot of heavy lifting and stuff. So by the time he went to the doctor, um, the doctor ran the tests. He was going to do the procedure, and he comes in to talk to him, and he says, we're not doing anything. He said, there's something radically wrong with you here. You're very sick. And so they put him in the hospital and they started running tests and trying to figure out what was going on with him. And um, to this day, they're really not sure. He he was, uh, uh, basically, we believe that he died of alcoholism, but he didn't look like an alcoholic. And so the doctor was very stunned by the whole thing and um, by the time they did all the testing and figured everything out his kidneys and liver were shutting down so it was way too late for him and um, so you know we were very blessed we had uh, my daughter called me about two weeks before he passed away and she said mom you need to come he's not going to be here long and so I went up there for about the third time Um, and um, they put him in hospice and well instead of putting him in hospice his uncle wanted him to come stay at his house he had a beautiful home that overlooked um, these this beautiful forest of trees and my son was a real outdoorsman and so he um, was really liking that idea and we all were because they had a huge home and the blessing of this whole thing is is that we kind of had a family reunion before he died everybody came from all over and flew in and my my granddaughter came and brought her baby he got to see the baby before 
<clears throat> he passed away. But it was a long, grueling week. Um, I stayed there with him. And it was... Um, he had good days and bad days, and when he had really bad days, it was hard to watch him. So we were all getting real tired of it. You know, we were all exhausted, and by the end, I just prayed to God, I just let him go, please. You know, I don't want him to be in any more pain. Mm -hmm. And so that night, he uh, was up and down all night long, uh, not moving around, just sitting up and down, up and down. And um, the next morning, about... 8.40, he took his last breath, and his wife and I were there with him. And, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult. You know, I feel like I, um, I don't know, I was just like a walking zombie for a long time after that because uh, I think I was traumatized from the way he died. Um, you know, the, the fact that of what all we went through. So anyway, um, we lost him, and um, that was how it went. Um, you may have answered this question already, but I wanted to make sure if there's anything more you want to mm -hmm. say to this. But what, what, should, what should people know about the pain that a parent goes through with the death of a child? Well, it's a pain like no other. You don't ever get over it. And that's one of the questions here that, um, you asked me to talk about, and that's one thing that people um, hopefully will never say to someone who's lost a child, especially, is that, you know, well, you're just going to have to move on, um, which I've done very gracefully, I believe, and I'm able to help other people. And I'm so amazed. At, I think what helped me the most is so many women have lost children from one thing or another, and that helped me a lot. A lot of the ladies here in the church have lost you know, loved ones, their sons and daughters. And and that really is, um, it's very uh, helpful to have people to be able to talk to. Somebody be else that has the same experience. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we're, it's all different, but in the end, it's all the same. It's a child. And I know someone said to me uh, recently, well, he wasn't a child. He was a grown man. And I that doesn't make any difference. He was still my son, and mm -hmm. he was my baby, and he always will be. And so that's how I look at it. Yeah. So. What What can people do in the midst of something like that? What What can others do to be helpful when, when that kind of tragedy takes place? Well, I I really think that we're all different. Um, for me, I got I talk about things. I'm I'm a talker. And I'd like to get things out. And, um, you know, I've had people kind of turn and walk the other way when I've talked about him. And mostly it's people that don't know him or didn't know him. But it's uncomfortable, and they just don't know what to say. And I used to experience that before I lost my son, is not quite knowing what to say. And sometimes it's just really a good idea to listen to that person and let them get it out because... You know, we just go through grief every day. I mean, it's like he's the first thing I think of when I wake up in the morning and the last thing I think of when I go to bed at night. And you just never get over it. It doesn't go away. And it's just something you have to learn to live with and move on. Um, but you don't get over it. Thanks, Linda. Uh -huh. You've answered all the questions that I had had uh -huh. le leading into this. But is there anything else you'd want to say that I didn't think to ask? Um, not really. I, I can't really think of anything right now. It's just that, you know, people need to um, understand that, you know, the loss of a child is the loss of a child. And um, we all grieve differently. And what I've chosen to do is be an example to others and try to, um, you know, help others when they, when they need to, um, have someone to listen to them because I can, I can do that. And, uh, listening is the most important thing because like I say, we, we do need to talk about it and, um, it's important. It, uh, 
um, and I choose to have, you know, pictures around of him and uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's it's a difficult thing to go through, and uh, we just have to be there for others. That's the main thing. And I think after the services, so many people just kind of vanish, and it's really important to check back with people. And, um, you know, everybody gets busy, and they kind of go on with their life, and, you know, you're sitting there, but I do have a cousin that calls me every morning, has ever since the day he died, and calls me every morning to check in. That's nice. And I find that very, very helpful to me. Thanks. Uh-huh. All right, I'll let you sit down. I'll say a prayer for you after you sit down, but please pray with me. Lord God, thank you so much for what Linda shared, for the wisdom that she shared, a practical um, advice that she gave, uh, it's sad that, um, as she shared, there are many people within our church family who have lost children, uh, their children, their, 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 their babies. Um, and we thank you that th- there's a sense that they're not alone, that there are other people that care along with them. I pray that you would help us to do some of the things that Linda shared, help us to learn how to listen to each other. Whatever the tragedy somebody else has gone through, help us to be careful to listen, to not just turn and walk away, but to give ear to the other person. Help us to not just forget, um, but, but, but to keep checking in on people. Grow within us your kind of caring heart. Uh, Lord, this is a particular worship service where we focus a lot on, on praise, Our songs are focused on praise, and so we do want to lift up our praise to you. We praise you that even in the midst of the struggles we're going through uh, with this virus and all the the, um, ramifications of that to our nation, we praise you that you are a God who never leaves us, never abandons us. You are always with us. We praise you that in the midst of the, the restlessness, the being stuck in a home, Uh, not be able to get out, all those kinds of things, that you give to us a peace from above, a peace that surpasses understanding. We praise you in the midst of a time when our energy is depleted, where we feel worn out. You fill us with a strength from you to do all things. We praise you that nothing can separate us from your love. We praise you that you are here with us now and you always will be until you call us home to be with you in your home in heaven forever. We pray for the the people and the ministries of Faith Presbyterian Church here in Sun City. We pray for the ministry uh, of Heart Pantry. We thank you for the service they provide and providing meals for a homeless high school students. Um, And I don't know what's going on with that ministry right now with the schools closed, but I know that they're still working hard and I pray that you would guide them and equip them and supply them to be able to care for these homeless teenagers. And Lord, we pray for the health and safety of all of the members of this church. We pray for those who are in need at this time and we pray for those who are caring for those who are in need. Uh, We pray that you would protect and and guide our state and our nation uh, during this time when more businesses are opening. We pray that things would not get out of hand, but um, help us to be cautious and careful how we go about uh, living in this new environment. Guide us in all ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we have some special music by Beth Mavie.
This morning, the reading from the scriptures is Proverbs 3, verse 3 through 10. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and refreshment from the body. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My prayer of illumination today is taken from the scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We're in a place right now that uh, we think we're coming out of it, but we're not quite sure. We hope it uh, is not something that's going to plague us every year, every winter, for the rest of our days, and that they can find a cure pretty soon. And I believe they can, and that's my prayer for this morning. We have been walking our way through the Gospel of John, looking particularly at the encounters Jesus has with people, the conversations and the miracles in this Gospel. And today we are in chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 2 through verse 16. And this is what John records. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. Porticos. In these lay many invalids, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the, wa- into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. 
At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your mat and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. I confess that I've had a lifelong problem with getting an idea stuck in my head and then causing me to miss out on new opportunities because all of my attention is focused on that which is stuck in my head. Here's an example. When I was 10 years of age, I I stood on a stage at the Claremont Hotel in Berkeley, California, with two dozen other children beneath a net containing over 100 balloons. A man was talking to us, explaining that Inside of one of the balloons was a slip of paper with the word winner written on it. And that whichever little boy or girl found the balloon that held that winning slip of paper would win a Dick Tracy type uh, wrist radio. And I, as a young boy, I read the Sunday comics every week, and especially Dick Tracy. And so right away, I was focused on this wrist radio that I could win and all these daring uh, adventures I'd be in the midst of battling crooks. So I had, as soon as I walked up that stage and saw those balloons, I had in my head that the aim of this contest was to gather the most balloons. So I paid no attention to what the man said and to the idea that I needed to look for one particular balloon. So when the net was pulled away and the balloons all fell down, I immediately began grabbing as many balloons as I could. Uh, But there's a problem with that because when you have your hands full of balloons and you try to stuff in more balloons, you're always losing some of those balloons that you already have within your hands. Now, either because time had expired or because the man who was running that contest was a friend of my father's, Uh, he came over to me and said, "Uh, may I see this balloon? But I had stuck in my head, I needed to gather as many balloons as I could. And so he asked to see that balloon, and I said rather rudely, leave my balloon alone. Fortunately for me, that man was not put off by my rudeness. Uh, But he persisted, he broke the balloon, revealing the winning slip of paper, and I won that little wrist radio. I won the prize, but I should not have. My plan of attack was wrong. I had the winning slip of paper within my grasp, but I didn't even notice it because I had the wrong concept stuck in my head. I made that mistake over a silly little wrist radio that wore out within a matter of weeks. But in Jerusalem one day, there was a man who came very close to missing out on something far more valuable than a wrist radio. He came close to missing out on a miracle, the ability to regain an opportunity to walk. Here is what happened. For a long time, A man who had been disabled for 38 years had been spending most of his days beside a pool in the northeastern section of Jerusalem. The pool was named Beth Zatha 
meaning house of the olive. But many people called it Bethesda, meaning house of mercy. The pool got that nickname, Bethesda, house of mercy, because stories have been told of healings that took place in those waters. The stories revolved around a mysterious stirring of the water that had happened, that happened from time to time. Beneath the pool was a subterranean stream that bubbled up and disturbed the calm of that water from time to time. People came to believe that the disturbance of that water was caused by an angel. And they swore that the first person into that pool, following that disturbance, would be healed. Because of those stories... That pool attracted many people who longed for a miracle. They placed themselves under the shade of the porticos around the pool, staring intensely at the water, um, waiting for that water to be stirred so they might be the first ones into that pool following that disturbance. They inched and shoved their way closer to the pool, fearful that someone else might beat them into the water at the key time. As a result, this pool was not a place of relaxation, but was a place of anxious waiting. They were tense competitors. They were not happy campers. They were weary watchers. This is not a place where friendships flourished because in the race to get into the water, every neighbor was a competitor. At least one of the people at that pool had been there a long time. Out of compassion, Jesus approached this particular man with a simple question. Do you want to be made well? What a question. Does Jesus not understand that the reason he is at the pool is because he wants to get well? This should have been an easy question for that man to answer. He could have said, yes, of course, definitely, I sure do. But that man does not make any of those replies. In fact, the man does not even come close to answering the question that Jesus asked him. He says instead, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps in ahead of me. Despite Jesus' query as to whether this man would like to be made well, the man's mind is stuck on his own assumption. To be made well has to find, for him to be made well, he has to find some way to get into that water ahead of everybody else. That is the only subject that he speaks to. It's the only thing that he can wrap his mind around. Indeed, his attention remains so focused on watching for a disturbance of that water that he never even looks around to see who it is that speaks to him. He has no idea that this is Jesus. Earl Palmer offers a probable description of this man. He writes, Here is a portrait of a depressed and totally discouraged person. He is so completely captive to his negative feelings about this situation that he is unable even to hear a new question. His answer sounds more and more like an explanation that he had perhaps given over and over again. The man answers as if Jesus had asked the question, why are you here? Had he talked before to the committee from the Parks and Recreation Department or to students from the University of Jerusalem writing reports on current health hazards at the pool? His answer was a complaint about the injustice of the system which has all these years kept him from entering the pool. If Jesus had not interrupted the conversation, this man's next sentences 
might have urged that Jesus and his committee work toward a numbering system so that people like him who have no friends might have a chance at the pool when its waters are troubled. Because his mind was stuck on the wrong assumption, this man nearly missed out on the miracle that Jesus offered to him. Fortunately for him, Jesus persisted. Jesus repeated his offer to heal the man. This time, though, Jesus phrased it not as a gentle question, but as a clear command. Stand up, take your mat, and walk. The text goes on to declare, at once this man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. I find a couple of important lessons for us in this passage. Number one, Jesus' gentle invitation to make this man well and his strong command to the man to stand up both flow out of Jesus' deep compassion for this individual. Jesus wants to make him well. This truth also applies to us. The promises that God makes to us and the commands that God gives to us both flow out of God's consistent care for us. If we search through the scriptures to find promises that we like while avoiding God's commands to us to walk in his ways, we miss out on the fullness of life that God has in mind for us. If we appreciate God's promises, we should also appreciate and heed his commands to us. In their book, How People Grow, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend summarize this lesson. They write, Obedience is to look outside ourselves for our purpose, values, and decisions. This essential stance of life admits that God knows better than we do how to guide our steps. And it is the only way to truly live, for he is life itself. Number two, faith has to do with being willing to set aside what is stuck in our own head so that we can respond to God's leading for our lives. Robert Sutton puts it this way. He says, a television program preceding the 1988 Winter Olympics featured blind skiers being trained for slalom skiing. Paired with sighted skiers, the blind skiers were taught on the flats how to make right and left turns. When that was mastered, they were taken to the slalom slope where their sighted partners skied beside them shouting left and right. As they obeyed the commands, they were able to negotiate the course and cross the finish line. Depending solely on the sighted skier's word, it was either complete trust, or catastrophe. What a vivid picture of the Christian life. In this world, we are in reality blind about what course to take. We must rely solely on the word of the only one who is truly sighted, God himself. Faith has to do with learning to hear Christ's voice and to respond afresh to it again and again and again. Please pray with me. Lord, I confess and I apologize for how I get my mind stuck on one thing and I don't adjust very well uh, to new opportunities because I'm stuck on that one idea. But Lord, I am so grateful that for this particular man in John 5, 
when his mind was stuck on one idea, you persisted. You invited him and then you commanded him to get up and walk. Lord, help us to learn that your commands flow out of every bit as much love for us as your promises do. So help us to appreciate and heed those commands as much as we appreciate your promises. And help us to learn, Lord, that faith means that constant adjustment to your leading in our lives. Teach us to live by that adventure of listening to you, listening to and responding to your leading. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in singing together, uh, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. As our benediction today, I'd like to share the, Paul's promise to us in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May he be with you throughout this week. Amen.